Hi, this is Chris Date, and you're listening to the The Apologetics Podcast, Episode 81, Sola Scriptura. Before we get into today's debate between a Protestant and an Eastern Orthodox on the topic of Sola Scriptura, there are just a few things that I want to briefly talk about. Uh, the first thing is, last week I, I made a couple of uh, announcements of sorts. Uh, one is that I was looking for a new web hosting service because I wanted to move away from Podbean, uh, which has been an increasing source of frustration for me. Uh, and what's more is, you know, I, don't, I never blog anymore, and part of the reason is because I've been sick and tired of maintaining both a blog website and a podcast website, uh, and I wanted to combine the two. Well, uh, within days of having uh, published the last episode where I mentioned that, I received a very gracious offer by a web hosting company to host my website, uh, temporarily at least pro bono, um, and uh, should I at some point be able to afford their hosting fee, um, then I'll be able to pay them at that point. Um, so... I just think that's awesome. I've already begun to uh, copy over all of the podcast files over to the new web host. Uh, I've already made a lot of progress, and uh, I anticipate sometime within the next couple of weeks being able to start uh, publishing there and directing traffic in that direction. Um, don't worry about anything right now. Continue to subscribe to the Podbean feed, um, and uh, you know I will automatically update iTunes and Zoom to point to the new podcast feed once it's made available. So you don't need to do anything just yet, but just be aware that here in the near future, um, you'll have an opportunity to switch over the feed. And I'll continue to publish to both feeds, uh, at least for a while, if not until the end of my contract with Podbean, which is several months from now. Um, so you, you shouldn't have to do much work, and you'll have plenty of time before you stop receiving notifications from the other feeds. Uh, but this will be an opportunity to uh, to blog and podcast on the same website. I, it uses WordPress, which gives me a lot more flexibility uh, than I think the other two services used. And um, yeah, I'm just I'm just super excited. So be looking forward to that. The other thing that I mentioned last week uh, or last episode was that um, I was considering how it is that I could begin to accept donations, uh, personal gifts from my listeners, uh, well, from you, <laughs> my listeners. Uh, well, I, I went ahead and I signed up for a PayPal account for my podcast, for my ministry, I guess I should call it, uh, and I've created a donate button and a subscribe button with uh, several different subscription options um, so that if... If there are any of you, and please understand, I'm not going to be soliciting this frequently or anything like that, uh, but, if, but if any of you want to give a personal gift, either, either in the form of a one-time gift or a monthly gift subscri subscription, uh, I've got that available now. Um, if you go to theapologetics.podbean.com and uh, look in the pages on the left side menu, uh, you'll see a uh, you'll see some button uh, some links to pages which will have those buttons. And if you click on them, you'll be able to securely uh, make a one-time donation should you decide to, and you'll be able to subscribe monthly as well if you'd like. Um, and uh, you know, I'll, I'm going to continue to support the ministry out of my own pocket so long as I can. Uh, but any gifts that you do give me will go 100% to the ministry for things like web hosting fees. Again, once I can afford to pay the hosting company that's uh, doing it for free right now, uh, I'll be able to pay for web hosting fees, domain registration renewals, equipment, stuff like that. Uh, and one listener, I just want to thank you so much. I won't mention you by name, uh, but one listener has already uh, made a, a gift, a monthly gift subscription that I'm just thrilled about. I'm very excited, and uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, th those are available if, if you um, if you're so inclined. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to mention was that uh, you know I'm 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 still waiting to hear back from anybody who might be willing to take me up on the offer to debate annihilationism again. Um, I've received some polite declines and one very mean <laughs> decline from a very well-known proponent of traditionalism. Um, some of you can probably guess already who it is just by saying how mean his response was. I think he called me a heretic multi you know, something like nine times in his email. Uh, but uh, but I, I haven't received any um, acceptances <laughs> and there's still several invitations floating around out there. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm not going to make I'm not going to make my ministry all about annihilationism, and I'm not going to go desperately seek debates so that I can show people that this is an orthodox view, orthodox in the Protestant sense, not Eastern Orthodox. Um, 
it's just not worth the energy to frantically seek out a debate opponent. And I'm just going to sit back and see if anything comes my way. Uh, and in the meantime, I'll continue to podcast on a variety of other topics, and occasionally this one as well. But there is somebody who did get, very quickly actually, an acceptance to uh, to debate, and that's my good friend Dee Dee Warren, host of the Preterist podcast. Um, the, uh, the listener who's been sending invitations to people to debate me also sent out a... Um, uh, or was helping me to find people to debate Dee Dee Warren, and one name we came across was Alan Kirshner. And very soon after emailing him with that uh, suggestion, uh, Dee Dee and uh, Alan Kirshner were able to come to an agreement on a general time frame and a thesis and a format and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm just I'm just utterly thrilled. It's going to be an in-person uh, f- uh, formal debate. It'll be somewhere in South Florida. We're looking for venues to host a debate. If you guys have any suggestions, if you know of any venues in South Florida, churches or things like that, that might be willing to host a debate on preterism, um, please email me at theapologetics at hotmail.com or dd at preteristpodcast at gmail.com and let us know uh, if you have any suggestions. We're also looking for volunteers to do um, video and audio recording so that we can publish the debate in either Dee's debate, or I mean, either Dee's podcast or mine, or both, or whatever. So, if you want to volunteer, if you live in the South Florida area, or would like to travel there and do some tech stuff to, you know, record the uh, record video and audio, that'd be great. Again, email us if you if you would like to do that. Uh, and what I'm really excited about is, oh, and by the way, I should probably mention—I don't think I already did—that it's going to be in the winter time frame. So we're talking December of 2012 or January of 2013. Uh, presuming, of course, that the world doesn't come to an end by then. Uh, but I'm really excited because both have agreed to allow me to moderate the debate, uh, which is really incredible. I'm very excited. I've already gotten permission from, from my wife to begin saving for a round-trip ticket and a hotel, you know, a night stay at a hotel room. Uh, and, you know, this is going to be really good motivation to lose a bunch of weight, too, so I can look good in the suit in front of the camera uh, and do the moderating. But I'm just super excited. I hope that you are as well. Um, I, I will not, by the way, be using any of the donations that come into my podcast to fund my trip over to Florida. Uh, I'll do that entirely my, out of my pocket. If you would like to donate, however, to Dee Dee, um, that would be really helpful as they've agreed, Alan and Dee Dee have agreed that Dee Dee, uh, since, uh, since Dee Dee lives in South Florida and Alan will have to travel from New Jersey to South Florida to do the debate, uh, Dee Dee has agreed to pay half of Alan's expenses. And so if you, um, if you would like to contribute to Dee Dee's ministry so that she can help pay to have Alan uh, fly from New Jersey to South Florida, definitely email her at preteristpodcast at gmail.com or you can go to the preteristblog.com and there are some links there to donate to her podcast. I would definitely encourage you to contribute something. I think it's going to be uh, a fantastic debate. Um, I've rambled on for a good amount of time, so I guess I guess that's about all I've got to say. Let's go ahead and play the next uh, promo in my promo rotation, uh, which is for Carm Radio with Matt Slick. There is a God. You are not him. Welcome to Faith and Reason, the apologetics, Christian-based apologetics show, where we answer difficult questions about Christianity. We expose the errors of such things as atheism, Roman Catholicism, evolution, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Christian science, New Age, Islam, and various other religious and secular systems. Why? Because Jesus alone is the way to truth and life, and if you don't receive him as your Savior, you're lost and you're in trouble on the Day of Judgment. Matt runs the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, other, otherwise known as CARM, which you can find at www.carm.org. You can listen to CARM Radio's uh, podcast, which used to be known as Faith and Reason, but isn't any longer, so I'm, I think I might have to change that promo. Uh, but it's live with Matt Slick, Monday through Friday, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific Time, on KSPD in Boise, Idaho, AM 790. Or you can subscribe to the podcast for free. Uh, Matt and I don't see eye to eye on several things, not the least of which is annihilationism, um, but uh, um, but you know I really enjoy his ministry. I think that on some key essential areas he's very good, um, and you know his his uh, obstreperous I think that's the word his obstreperous uh, demeanor um, while putting off in some cases and other cases can be quite enjoyable to listen to. Uh, it's not for everybody, but um, I would encourage you to check it out if you haven't already and, and make your mind up for yourself. Uh, so again, that's www.carm.org for the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry with Matt Slick. And with that, let's move into today's debate. They form the only infallible rule of faith for which we base the church. Let's talk about inspiration. God 
God is the art that no mistake can make it. Yeah. 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 As the words I'm speaking are being recorded, it's Tuesday, March 27th, 2012. But whenever it is you're listening, hello and thank you so much for tuning in to what is now the sixth The Apologetics Podcast Debate, this time dealing with the doctrine of sola scriptura and whether or not scripture is the final authority for Christians. And it'll be between a Protestant and an East Eastern Orthodox theologian. Rob Bowman is my Protestant guest today. Rob is currently Director of Research at the Institute for Rel Religious Research. He previously served as Manager of Apologetics and Interfaith Evangelism for the North American Mission Board. He's taught at Luther Rice University and at Biola. He's author of Putting Jesus in His Place, The Case for the Deity of Christ. And that's just to list a few items from his proverbial CV. Rob, thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Reverend Lawrence Cleanwork is my Eastern Orthodox guest. Lawrence is editor of the Eastern Greek Orthodox New Testament. He's the rector of St. Innocent's Orthodox Church in Eureka, California. He serves on the faculty of Humboldt State University and at Euclid. And he's the managing editor of the Orthodox Answers website, just to list a few items from his CV. Lawrence, thanks, thank you so much as well for joining me. My pleasure, too. With those introductions out of the way, let me briefly explain today's debate. The proposition is this, affirming sola scriptura, Scripture is the only infallible rule of doctrine and practice for Christians today. Rob Bowman affirms the proposition, and Lawrence Kleenewerk denies it. They have agreed to the following format. Rob will begin with a 15-minute opening statement affirming the proposition, followed by Lawrence's 15-minute opening. Rob will give his 10-minute rebuttal, followed by Lawrence's 10-minute rebuttal. And at that point, Lawrence will have 10 minutes to cross-examine Rob, followed by 10 minutes in which Rob will cross-examine Lawrence. Following cross-examination, cross Lawrence will present his five-minute closing, and then Rob will finish with his five-minute closing. Uh, that will close the debate proper, but then we'll have about 30 minutes of Q&A in which I will ask four questions, some of which were sent in to me by listeners, uh, each to Rob and Laurent, alternating between them. The one to whom the question is directed will have two and a half minutes to respond, and his opponent will have 60 seconds to follow up, and that'll wrap things up. So, with all that out of the way, I'm going to open briefly in prayer, and we'll jump right in. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for bringing us together today. Um, I know that we sharply disagree on this topic. Some of us do. Uh, I just pray that um, that you would, we know that you're living and active. And so as much as we may disagree here, we know that you can guide us into the truth and help us to know what it is that you've designed to be the infallible rule of doctrine and practice for the church today. I, I pray that you would soften the hearts of those of us that are participating today and those of us who may be listening, uh, who may be wrong when it comes to this question. Soften our hearts, guide us into the truth. And as importantly as that, if not more so, help us to, to remain calm and respectful. Help, help us to discuss this in a loving and gracious fashion uh, so that anybody listening who might not know your son, Jesus Christ, will not be put off by the demeanor of us uh, imperfect human beings. So again, thank you so much. And uh, it's in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Rob, um, if you're ready to go, then as soon as you start talking, I'll start your 15-minute timer for your opening statement. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me in this uh, debate, and uh, Lawrence, thank you for participating. Uh, the proposition that I, as an evangelical Protestant, will be defending in this debate is the following. Scripture is the only infallible rule of doctrine and practice for Christians today. This proposition expresses what evangelical Protestants uh, mean by the doctrine known by its Latin name sola scriptura, or scripture only. Now, there is a sense in which my task can be reduced to that of defending the word only in the proposition, or more precisely, the words the only. This is because the Orthodox Church uh, historically has affirmed that scripture is an infallible rule of doctrine and practice for Christians today. The issue that divides Protestant and Orthodox Christians here is not the infallibility of scripture, but whether the church or any of its pronouncements outside the Bible uh, is also an infallible rule of doctrine and practice for Christians today. For example, John Anthony McGuckin, in his 2008 book, The Orthodox Church, states, and I quote, While orthodoxy ascribes infallibility to the scriptures as the word of God, it does not divorce them from the tradition at all, uh, in the way, end quote, in the way that uh, McGuckin sees Protestants as doing. 
so I don't plan to be defending the inb- infallibility of Scripture here, since it should be a given uh, common ground between evangelical Protestants and Orthodox believers. Of course, if I were debating a liberal Protestant or a Mormon on the nature of Scripture, I would not be able to take the infallibility of Scripture as a given. The focus of this debate, then, is on the sola, the word only, in the Reformation slogan, sola scriptura. Like all slogans, this one can be misunderstood, so let's be clear about what it does not mean. First, sola scriptura does not mean that the Bible is all Christians need. It is not all that we need to be saved or to live a faithful Christian life. Me and my Bible is not a complete picture of the Christian life. More than anything, of course, what I need is Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus and me isn't an exactly complete picture of the Christian life either, but at least it would express the right priority. In addition to Christ's saving work on my behalf, I need the Holy Spirit, I need the Bible, I need prayer, I need the sacraments, and so on. Uh, I also need the church uh, for many reasons. I need to hear the gospel. That happens through the witness of people who are part of the church. I need to participate in corporate worship of God. That happens in the church. I need the encouragement of fellowship with other believers in the church. I need to be instructed, exhorted, challenged, rebuked, comforted. That all happens in the church. Uh, Sola Scriptura does not deny or diminish the importance of any of these things. Second, Sola Scriptura does not mean a rejection of all tradition. The historic evangelical doctrine of sola scriptura is that taught by the Protestant reformers of the 16th century, such as Luther and Calvin, who held the traditions of Christianity, especially those of the early church, uh, in high esteem. This Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura should be clearly distinguished from what might be called and has been called restorationism. Restorationism maintains that the church either ceased to exist altogether or that it was so thoroughly corrupt that the proper approach was to start over from scratch, uh, ignoring and rejecting all traditions uh, between the first century and whatever day you happen to be living in, and just reinvent Christianity. Restorationists have often rejected the classic Christian doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation, And even those who don't reject these doctrines typically view the early creeds in which they are set forth, such as the Apostles and Nicene creeds or the Council of Chalcedon's definition, with great suspicion. Now, the Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura doesn't fall into this erroneous way of thinking. It respects what the early church fathers called the rule of faith, which was the essential basic confession articulated in the Apostles' Creed and elaborated later in the Nicene Creed. Okay, then, so what does sola scriptura mean, and why should you accept it? Let me answer this question by explaining and defending uh, what I will call the basis, meaning, and significance of the sola in sola scriptura. First, the basis of the sola is that scripture is the only verbal word of God available or accessible to the church. Now, there are two parts to the argument here. A, Scripture is the only written word of God available to us today. And B, we have no human beings living on the earth today whose oral teachings are the word of God. All right, so point A, uh, dealing with the basis of the sola. That scripture is the only written word of God is, for Christians, really true by definition. Whatever is the written word of God is, by definition, scripture. Whatever extant available texts that are the word of God are and should be recognized as scripture by the church. Other written materials accessible to us may be true, uplifting, faithful, valuable, but they're not the word of God, and therefore they are not scripture. What makes scripture unique, what sets it apart, is that it is the only written word of God in the church's possession. Christ and the authors of the New Testament affirmed this unique character of scripture in many ways. In numerous places, they attribute the very words of scripture to God as his word. Jesus, for example, actually uses the expression, the word of God, in reference to scripture in Mark 7.13 and in John 10.34-35. 
just to name a couple of obvious examples. Point B is that we have no human beings living on the earth today whose oral teachings are the word of God. In other words, we don't have living prophets and apostles. Again, if I were debating a Mormon, this would be a focal point of disagreement, but it shouldn't be here. The Orthodox Church does not claim to be led by prophets and apostles. Apostles in the New Testament were individuals who had personally seen and heard the risen Christ, as seen in such passages as Acts 1, verses 21 to 25, 1 Corinthians 9, 1, and who had received their commission directly from Jesus Christ, as Paul, for example, says that he had in Galatians 1, notably verses 1 and 11 to 12. In Ephesians 2.20, Paul tells us that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the church's cornerstone. That term foundation is a metaphor picturing the apostles as their, in their unique and unrepeatable role as the first generation founding members and witnesses of the church. No disrespect to any Christian leaders to living today, but none of them can claim to be apostles or prophets. None of them can claim that their teaching is the word of God. This is why I wanted the word today in the resolution that we are debating here. Scripture is the only infallible rule of doctrine and practice for Christians today. Now, the biblical arguments that non-Protestants often use to establish an oral tradition distinct from the written word of God in Scripture These arguments fail because the biblical texts on which they are based are not referring to an oral communication that is available to us today. Take, for example, Paul's statement in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter, end quote. Only by ripping this text out of its historical context can it be imagined to support the idea of an authoritative oral tradition existing in the 21st century, distinct from the written word of God in Scripture. What Paul is saying to the Thessalonians is that they should hold on to the apostles' teaching, whether they received it orally in person from the apostles themselves or in writing in the form of an epistle. Now, if we had audio recordings of the apostles' teachings, those could function as authoritative alongside the epistles. But, of course, we don't. If we want to know what the apostles taught, uh, we can find out for sure only through the writings that they left behind in the New Testament. If we have no oral word of God available to to us today, and if Scripture is all of the written word of God available to us today, then, of course, it follows that only Scripture is the verbal communication or word of God available to us today. And this is really the whole basis for Sola Scriptura. The doctrine of Sola Scriptura is really an appeal to Christians to look to God alone as the final infallible authority for the church. If I may put it this way, Sola Scriptura is really based on Solus Deus, God alone. It means that God is the sole infallible authority. God is infallible, and what God says, his word, is, of course, infallible. No other verbal communication or material available to us has this character of being the absolutely trustworthy, infallible word of God. Creeds may be admirable, noble, even faithful statements, but they're not the word of God. The church may learn from them, be guided by them, uh, but they are not the word of God. Well, what then does sola scriptura mean? It means that scripture is the only publicly accessible, infallible, verbal expression of God's truth in the world. Oh, there are all sorts of other fine expressions of God's truth, but the only verbal expression of God's truth that is publicly accessible, visible, infallible, is God's word in scripture. For example, the sacraments are wonderful expressions of the gospel but they are nonverbal. Private promptings of the Holy Spirit to individuals are expressions of God's truth, but they're not publicly accessible, visible. Uh, They're not something that can function as the rule of, of doctrine and practice for the church. Creeds are publicly accessible, verbal expressions of God's truth, but they're not infallible. That is, they are not guaranteed to be unfailingly 
uh, true because they are not God's word. Infallible doesn't just mean true. It means that what is said cannot fail to be true. It cannot be false in any way. The basis of sola scriptura, then, is that only scripture is the written word of God available to us today. What sola scriptura means is that only scripture is a publicly accessible, infallible, verbal expression of God's truth available to us today. The significance of this doctrine is that only scripture is the infallible rule of doctrine and practice for Christians today. Only those truths about God and our saving relationship with him that are clearly taught in Scripture or shown to follow from the teachings of Scripture may be required of Christians uh, to believe. Non-Protestants constantly argue that this conclusion is not itself taught in Scripture and therefore is self-defeating. If Scripture does not teach sola scriptura, so the argument goes, then sola scriptura cannot be true. Not a few Protestants have been misled into accepting this reasoning and consequently have left Protestantism for some other form of Christianity, whether Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy, or, much worse, a heretical sect such as the Mormon religion. But this argument against sola scriptura is quite flawed because, in fact, the doctrine follows from what Scripture clearly teaches. I've already summarized the evidence from Scripture that Scripture is the Word of God and that what human beings say outside of Scripture uh, that we have available to us today does not rise to the level of the authority of the words of the apostles and prophets speaking on behalf of God. Uh, this is really the whole basis of the doctrine of sola scriptura, and it comes straight from the Bible itself. Of course, while the apostles were still alive, they expected Christians to treat their oral teaching as equally authoritative to their written teaching. In this respect, the first generation church's infallible rule was not limited to written scripture, a fact that non-Protestants take out of historical context to exploit as an argument against sola scriptura. But we see the apostles themselves in later New Testament writings pointing the way as the church was about to make the transition from the apostolic era to the post-apostolic era. For example, in Second Peter, the apostle Peter recognizes that his life is coming to an end and the church is going to be assaulted by false teachers. His advice to them is not to submit to the infallible teaching of the church, but rather, quote, to remember the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Now, if we want to remember those words today, we can do so by finding them in the Old and New Testaments. The doctrine of sola scriptura, then, is scripturally based. It follows from the unique character of scripture as the only available verbal word of God for the church today. All other teachings, therefore, whether found in creeds or confessions or any opinions of men, however uh, respectable, uh, however faithful those Christians may be, must be tested by the word of God, which is found for us today only in scripture. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Rob. Uh, Lawrence, it's now your turn, and as soon as you start delivering your opening statement, I'll start your 15-minute timer. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, this uh, excellent uh, opening statement, Rob. I think it was a good presentation, and I've seen your debates before, and I think this could be a very uh, uh, respectful and constructive discussion and exchange. Now, my task today is obviously uh, to be the, the negative person, to... Uh, to go against the, the proposition, and it's always a bit uncomfortable to do so because, as you mentioned, uh, there's a lot of agreement there on the uh, unique nature of Holy Scripture. And so I will indeed uh, offer some uh, counter-arguments and also try to offer a more positive and constructive approach to the Scriptures in the context of church and tradition. Also, it is difficult to write a proposition for a debate over sola scriptura, because as a slogan, as in fact Rob explained, it can be a misleading slogan, and that is one point that I will try to emphasize and uh, express concern over, even though Rob did a very good job trying to narrow down the meaning of this, uh, this slogan. In many ways, from an orthodox pers- perspective, Sola Scriptura is almost correct. If I may, for example, uh, cite the Catechism uh, 
uh, by uh, Metropolitan Hilarion. Uh, it's called The Mystery of Faith. He writes in his introduction, page 8, that dogmas are revealed by God and are based on Scripture. So we agree that the Scriptures have a unique authority and that sola scriptura, as we will see, could be true in a narrow sense. However, what I want to emphasize, first of all, and which, in fact, Rob admitted, is that as a slogan, it is, uh, it is something that can be misunderstood, uh, that is often misunderstood, and that can be extremely dangerous and even toxic. It's easy for someone to say, sola scriptura, therefore, I operate without tradition, and I operate without the church. All I need is my infallible Bible, and I can do all these things. In a way, it reminds me of the famous triple rope of the book of Proverbs, which for us would be scripture, church, and tradition, compared to a single rope, which would be uh, the Bible disconnected from its proper environment. So I want to look at the proposition, and I want to, to show what would be some of the, the points of concern with it. It starts with, of course, affirming sola scriptura, and I've explained the concern with definitions. Definitions vary so much that it's difficult to really have an agreement among Protestants on exactly what it means. Uh, for example, in the uh, Westminster Confession of 1648, which is still uh, quite authoritative among uh, Protestants, it says that the authority of the Holy Scripture which it ought to be believed and obeyed, depends not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God. And of course, this brings us to the first word here is Scripture. Scripture is the only infallible. But what Scripture? As the uh, well-known uh, Protestant apologist uh, R.C. Sproul has admitted... The scriptures must be seen then as a fallible collection of infallible texts, if indeed the scriptures have no need for a testimony from the church. We would, on the other hand, say that the scriptures can function as such because of an external organism or divinely appointed authority, which is, in this case, the, the bishop's of the churches discerning what the canon ought to be. And indeed, when Christians discuss what the scriptures teach, the question what scripture is indeed very important because what canon, how many books, what textual platform for the New Testament or for the Old Testament, what translation will we use, what interpretation when there is controversy over translation. I'm assuming that Rob means the originals in the original language, that's the infallible uh, document. But we can see that there's, there's a real concern here regarding the very concept of Scripture. It does not exist in a vacuum. It is related, it is inseparable from the organism that produced it. There's also the question of the word infallibility. What does it mean to be infallible? As Rob said, well, the best would be to say sola dei. Only God in the Trinity is infallible. Only God can save us. I would prefer to have the slogan sola amor, love only, because as St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, this beautiful text, love never fails. Love is infallible, and God, of course, is love. I could even say that Sola Ecclesia, this uh, much um, uh, criticized uh, uh, slogan uh, for those who prefer Sola Scriptura, Sola Ecclesia actually has also some significant scriptural backing because in Matthew 16, verse 18, we see that the church will not fail in its battle against the gates of death or Hades. In the ultimate battle that really matters to us, the one against death, the church will not fail. The church is, in that sense, in the sense of salvation, infallible. It is also described, as we know, in 1 Timothy 
as the pillar and foundation of the truth and the household of God. Finally, the scriptures never exist, you could almost say objectively, as an object that is disconnected from a reader. In other words, the Holy Spirit that inspired the, the scriptures and also uh, was at work to preserve the scriptures needs to be at work in the believer, and that would be for us in the context of the life of the church, for it to be properly understood. Otherwise, the same Peter, which um, uh, Rob cited, uh, can say that in St. Paul things are difficult to understand, and they can be twisted for one's own destruction. And we Orthodox uh, see this twisting and the explosion of denominations and the variety of opinions because of this. We say that the scriptures disconnected from church and tradition will indeed uh, result in this, you could say, failed state of Christianity today, extreme division and controversy. And then the proposition talks about the scripture being the sole infallible uh, authority for doctrine and practice. Now, I would say that Orthodox Christians would have no major issue with the word dogmas or doctrines because the scriptures do contain the, the, the kerygma and the dogmas of the faith. As I cited uh, Bishop Hilarion, now a leading bishop, uh, uh, Metropolitan Hilarion, that the dogmas must be based in the Holy Scriptures. What is not derived from Scripture cannot, in fact, be dogmatized. However, when it comes to the issue of practice, there's a real concern here, because it is very clear for those who read the New Testament and see what kind of a document it is, that the way things are done in the church, such as the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, the two you know, major uh, sacraments that Protestants recognize, there is no instruction on how it is to be done. And therefore, I would suggest that when it comes to the inner life of the church, tradition is needed to have an infallible, that is, a secure way to do things in a way that is God-pleasing and in conformity with what the apostles did and taught. For instance, the verse that Rob cited, uh, which is uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, which talks about the apostles delivering both oral tradition and teaching as well as written teaching, the epistles, I would say that this of course, shows that the scriptures themselves do not teach Sola Scriptura because the scriptures are written at a time of inscripturation. Therefore, Sola Scriptura does not operate during this time. For it to be taught in scripture, it would have to say, after the apostles are gone, then you will only have the scriptures as your sole infallible rule of faith for doctrine and practice. And we do not actually see this uh, teaching. I would further say that when it comes to the, the practices, in this case, uh, the sacraments, what we can see is that the inner life of the church, what in fact we call the mysteries in the Orthodox uh, tradition, were reserved like pearls, so to speak, for those who were members of the church. Indeed, those who were not members were dismissed and could not remain during the services. And so St. Basil uh, would later on explain that the churches have received these traditions from the apostles, which were not in writing because they were intentionally preserved in the churches through the bishops and presbyters and deacons in succession, not to be revealed uh, at first and they were, of course, uh, eventually uh, written down. And so this tradition, which was oral at first, then became written. And this for us is very important because by following these traditions, we know that we are not failing to accomplish God's work in uniting people to Jesus Christ in these great and holy mysteries. And then finally, there is the word today, the sole infallible rule of truth and uh, doctrine and practice for Christians today. 
I think the point is that, uh, as I mentioned, and as was admitted, is that it wasn't true when the scriptures were written, that is, in biblical times. Because at that point in time, Sola Scriptura was not in operation because the Word of God was delivered both orally by the apostles and also in writing. And so this leads to a real question about how this process took place and how can the Scriptures teach Sola Scriptura when, in fact, that is not an operating principle at the time of inscripturation. There's other issues that need to be discussed, but I want to affirm that the Orthodox proposal, therefore, is that even though the Scriptures do contain the saving proclamation of Jesus Christ and the love of God in Jesus Christ, however, this has to be completed uh, in the Church and through tradition to be the triple road that does not fail to bring God's people to salvation. And I'm uh, done here with my uh, opening statement. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Um, with that, Rob, if you're ready to go, as soon as I hear you speaking, I'll begin your 10-minute timer for your first rebuttal. All right. Uh, well, Lawrence, thank you very much for your opening statement, and uh, we've got two interesting uh, perspectives on the table. Uh, I would like to uh, start off by simply uh, pointing out, as best I could tell, and it's possible I missed it, uh, but as far best I could tell, uh, Lawrence, you did not uh, provide us with uh, any basis for thinking that something other than Scripture uh, provides to us today an infallible rule of faith and practice. There was no real argument that such a thing exists outside of Scripture, uh, but rather simply objections to uh, the doctrine of sola scriptura that uh, that don't provide a, a real counterexample to the claim, which is that Scripture alone has this uh, character, this authority, uh, as the infallible rule of faith and practice, or of doctrine and practice. And I think that would be my overarching uh, response to much of what you had to say, was that I might even agree with a lot of what you said, but at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't really... Uh, undermine the Protestant position uh, because it fails to do what needs to be done, which is to specify and to defend the claim that there is something other than Scripture that functions as an infallible rule of doctrine and practice uh, for Christians today. Now, uh, you mentioned a number of things that uh, you know perhaps we could uh, discuss more profitably in the back and forth. I, I don't know, but I will try to uh, hit on a few points uh, in your opening statement. Uh, you uh, mentioned the problem of the canon of Scripture and cited, as uh, many uh, critics of uh, Sola Scriptura are, are now doing, for, for, from what I can tell, uh, as an, a damaging admission, uh, R.C. Sproul's statement that the canon is a fallible collection of infallible texts. I don't think this is uh, necessarily the best way of wording it, but I don't know that it's incorrect either. I think that what we're looking at here is a reality that will not be uh, cannot be escaped uh, by simply rejecting sola scriptura, and that is that God and what God says is infallible, but human perception of what God says will always be fallible. And this is the this is a very important principle that needs to be understood and I think it's at the heart of the disagreement frankly. Human beings except when God superintends their speech, human beings are fallible in what they say. They're fallible in their understanding and they're fallible in their verbalization of God's truth. Even when they are simply trying to paraphrase what Scripture says, they are fallible because uh, we are all imperfect and uh, uh, we all have our perspectives and our limitations and so forth. And so our perception of God's truth is always going to be fallible. Now, this is the case with everything. This is the case with the canon of Scripture. Uh, 
This is the case with the text of Scripture. For example, I don't have an infallible knowledge of the correct textual reading in every case of every variant that we find in the Old and New Testament manuscripts. Nobody does. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, Scripture isn't the infallible Word of God. It just means that our knowledge of that infallible Word of God is fallible. Scripture is infallible. Our knowledge of Scripture is not infallible. That's true of the canon. That's true of the text. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not right about the canon. It just means that we're not infallible in our thinking about the canon. Now, that's easy enough to demonstrate from church history itself. If the church had an infallible uh, knowledge of the canon as the uh, Holy Spirit in, uh, inspired and led church, uh, then there would never have been centuries of argument and debate about the extent of the canon, both for the New Testament and the Old Testament. The church would simply have known, because it would have had this infallible, uh, charismatic leading of the Holy Spirit, uh, which would assure that they would know uh, from the get-go what was Scripture and what was not. But they didn't have that. Uh, there was debate about the extent of the canon. There was debate about which books belonged and which books did not. Uh, and it, the debate went on for centuries. Uh, the reason why it went on is because human beings have a fallible knowledge of all things, including the canon, the text of Scripture, and the proper interpretation of Scripture. So uh, human beings may be right about the canon. Some of us are and some of us aren't, I, su I suspect, right about the exact, exact extent of the canon. Uh, but that doesn't uh, change the fact that... Uh, Scripture alone is the infallible uh, rule of doctrine and practice. Now, you also suggested that while you would agree that all doctrine had to be biblical, it had to be rooted and, and demonst demonst demonstrable from Scripture, uh, that not all practice needs to be uh, demonstrable from Scripture. I actually agree, uh, but it doesn't change the fact, because my claim is not that all practice must be uh, de demonstrated from Scripture, but that all practice must be consistent with Scripture. Uh, the church can do anything it wants as long as it's being consistent with Scripture. So if they want to have liturgy uh, and arrange the liturgy in a particular way, if they want to use a particular form of music, uh, if they want to pr uh, do worship in a certain way, if they want to uh, use certain uh, uh, terminology or words in the performance of baptism, uh, all of that's fine as long as it's consistent with Scripture. Uh, so th my claim is not that all pr uh, practice must be uh, easily read off of Scripture, uh, but that it must be consistent with Scripture. And that any practice that is not demonstrable from Scripture, while it may be legitimate, cannot be imposed on all Christians. That is, you cannot require all Christians to go along with a practice uh, and uh, oblige them to submit to that practice and to, to accept it as given to be part of the church if it's not something that can be demonstrated from Scripture to be required of all Christians. That would be a, a, a natural implication of sola scriptura. Now, it's true that, as and I explained this in my opening statement, that while the apostles were still living, uh, the church would not be operating under a regimen that might be described as sola scriptura because they had living apostles whose words uh, verbally expressed, orally expressed, would carry the same authority in the church as written scripture. Uh, so naturally, during the New Testament period, you don't have the church operating by a principle of sola scriptura. What we could say is they're operating by a principle of sola verbi deus, or whatever the exact Latin phrase would be. I'm sorry, my Latin's not very good. Uh, only by the word of God. That's really what sola scriptura means. It means that we, the church is to be governed at, by the infallible rule of the word of God and nothing else. So if you've got the word of God in oral and written form, terrific. You go by both of them. If you only have it in written form, however, that's it. That's your infallible rule. So the rule doesn't change. It's always that the word of God, the verbal communication from God to man, 
is the only infallible rule of doctrine and practice for the church. That doesn't change. But the form of the word of God changes when you don't have men authorized to speak the word of God orally in the way that prophets and apostles could. Now, you mentioned 2 Thessalonians 2.15 in this connection, and as I already explained, 2 Thessalonians 2.15 is not talking about an oral tradition that is passed down beyond the first generation of the apostles. Here's where your position actually becomes anachronistic. Paul is talking about the fact that they were the Christians in Thessalonica were expected to accept the apostolic teaching, whether they got it orally in person or in the form of a written letter. Once the apostles are not around and their words are only reliably preserved in Scripture, then Scripture alone functions as the only infallible Word of God available to the church to govern its doctrine. Well, I've run out of time for this uh, uh, rebuttal, so uh, I will stop there. And again, thanks, Lawrence, very much for your kind and thoughtful presentation. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Rob. And now I'll turn to you, Lawrence, for your 10-minute rebuttal. Okay, I'd like to um, review a number of points that uh, Rob uh, brought forward, both in the opening statement and uh, uh, ideally in his uh, rebuttal. Uh, during the next uh, 10 minutes. Now, what uh, um, I wanted to emphasize, and I didn't hear really a disagreement, is that Sola Scriptura, because of the way it is understood and practiced, because of the way, as I mentioned from the uh, an older um, Confession of Faith, uh, Westminster uh, denies the role of the, fa of the Church as almost an indispensable agent to to practically bring the canon and the scripture as a usable uh, corpus uh, to uh, Christians. My main point, therefore, was that the slogan, which is so identified with uh, Protestantism and the Reformation, is in fact misleading, uh, dangerous, and possibly uh, toxic. And I want to make sure that this, uh, this uh, aspect is clear. The second um, uh, point that I wanted to uh, mention is that what then is there to offer if not sola scriptura? Since we agree that the scriptures have a unique, unique nature, a unique place, they're the only a certified uh, uh, word of God and apostolic teaching which we have today in a really certified form. What then orthodoxy offers is in fact what has always been in operation which is the church established by Christ to exist until the end of the age, to never fail in its uh, battle against uh, the gates of Hades. Uh, Hades. Secondly, tradition, which is two things. It simply means to pass things down. Tradition, therefore, is the way that the entire faith, that is, the dogmas, the doctrines, as well as the way things are done in the church, which is the household of God, are passed. And that's done through the offices of uh, uh, bishop, presbyter, and deacon, and through the, 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 the geographical continuity that has existed in orthodoxy since, uh, since uh, Pentecost. And then uh, tradition is also, of course, uh, what the apostles did do and did practice, which was, in fact, passed on. For example, uh, in the discussion about uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, what we have is a standing order to the Thessalonians, uh, I would say for as long as, uh, as uh, could be, that they would be uh, obedient and maintain the traditions or teachings that were given to them by the apostles, either orally or in uh, writing. This is a standing order. To this very day, by the way, there is a Christian community in Thessaloniki, which is, uh, of course, a Greek Orthodox church, and what they have received from the apostles, and I'll give you examples, they still practice unchanged. This, I would say, is a standing order, and I would also uh, give a reason to believe that what, is, what was passed on 
orally was especially concerning the liturgical practices. For example, when uh, when St. Paul t- writes to the Corinthians, another uh, church in Greece to this very day, by the way, um, uh, he says, what I have received, I also hand it down to you. Then he talks in 1 Corinthians 11 about the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, how it was to be administered. There is the language of tradition that is specifically applied to the sacraments uh, or mysteries. In other words, for the scriptures to really function practically, it has to function in a context and in a relationship with church and tradition. Because as we have heard from Rob, there is the, you could say, the ideal concept, sola scriptura, uh, the certainty that is in God's realm about the text of scripture, about the canon. And then there is the reality of, of us. Uh, and he admits that, well, uh, we have uh, only limited knowledge, fallible knowledge, we are not quite sure about things. And this is why there was a process, for example, with the discernment of the canon. But again, this discerning of the canon was inseparable from tradition, which informed the bishops about the origin of these books to validate where they were coming from, their use in the local churches, as well as the authority given to the churches, therefore to the bishops as, as, as heads of their uh, individual churches, uh, the church being the pillar and foundation of the truth, and having received this tremendous authority from the Lord, since in case of a dispute, there was a permanent mechanism in Matthew 18, which is recourse to the church. Can it be therefore said that Christians can change worship and decide to do things differently? We would say no. I'll give you an example where uh, there will be a debate in about two weeks. I know that Rob and I would disagree is the issue of infant baptism. Now clearly, sola scriptura Christians disagree strongly on this particular topic. Why? Because the scriptures are not meant to give us information about how the sacraments, the mysteries are to be administered. We could make a very strong case uh, for infant baptism from the scriptures alone. But what really clinches it, so to speak, is that Origen, writing in about the uh, uh, 200s, says that it is from the apostles that the churches have received this practice to baptize infants. And to this very day, therefore, what is described in these early documents is still practiced in the Orthodox churches. If I had uh, uh, more time, I would read what St. Basil wrote uh, around the year uh, 350. The same St. Basil, who writes that the scripture is to be the, uh, the ultimate judge when there's a dispute in matters of, of dogma, because dogmas have to be rooted in the scriptures. But the same St. Basil says that, and I'll read here from uh, his uh, treatise on the Holy Spirit, uh, section 66, he says, of the beliefs and practices, whether generally accepted or publicly enjoined, which are preserved in the church, some we possess, derived from written teaching, other we have received delivered to us, quote, in a mystery that is by way of the sacraments, by the tradition of the apostles. And both of these, in relation to true religion, have the same force. No one will dare say, no one who is moderately versed in the institutions of the church uh, to dispute this. And then he talks about these traditions coming from the apostles, uh, which are... Uh, in a way, infallible in the, in the sense that if we do not follow the, these traditions, then we are simply inventing things and we are less and less secure. There's less and less certainty. But if we do these things, we have the certainty that these things, which were, has been, have been practiced by the Holy Churches for centuries, which have apostolic origin, truly uh, are in, in harmony with the mind of Christ. And so, uh, in this particular description by St. Basil, he cites all these things which to this very day the Orthodox do. The sign of the cross, the uh, triple immersion at baptism, the anointing with holy, the holy chrism, facing east in prayer, not to kneel on Sunday, 
And he explains that all of these things are important and that without these things, then if you only have the scriptures, which you disconnect ultimately to your own interpretation and disputes from the, the body of the apostolic churches and from the tradition received over these early centuries, then what you have is a, is a disintegration that we see in uh, the Protestant world and therefore a, a, f a failure of the scriptures to function, which is to bring Christ uh, to people and people to Christ through the church which he established. That will conclude my uh, rebuttal. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Okay, well, I hope you that you're enjoying the debate as much as I was at this point. That concludes the first half of the debate, and in the second half, you'll get to hear cross-examination, closing arguments, and Q&A, and that'll be in episode 82. Until then... Hi, this is Chris Date, and you're listening to the The Apologetics Podcast, episode 82, Tradition. Before we get into the second half of the Sola Scriptura debate with Protestant Rob Bowman and Eastern Orthodox Reverend Lawrence Cleanwork, let me remind you where we left off in the previous episode. Rob gave his opening statement affirming that Scripture is the only infallible rule of doctrine and practice for Christians today. He argued that only Scripture is the Word of God and that while the Apostles delivered the Word of God verbally and inscripturated the New Testament, this kind of authority does not exist today. Instead, Rob argued, they told their readers to hold fast to that which they had already delivered to them, whether in the form of a letter or by word of mouth, explaining why he thinks that critics of Sola Scriptura take this verse, uh, the verse that reads it this way, out of its context to mean something else. Lawrence then gave his opening statement denying the debate proposition, explaining why he thinks the slogan Sola Scriptura is dangerous and potentially toxic, resulting in all sorts of denominations and uh, differences in, in interpretation. He explained that the Eastern Orthodox Church sees apostolic tradition as infallible, of which scripture is just one part, and that scripture, church, and tradition, all three of those, were never intended to be divorced from one another. Rob then gave his rebuttal, followed by Lawrence's rebuttal, and it was at that point that we left off, so let's move right back into the debate with Lawrence cross-examining Rob. And how do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word, tradition. Okay, so, uh, Lawrence, whenever you're ready, you get to cross-examine Rob first, and I'll start your ten minutes as soon as you begin. Okay, then um, I would like to um, ask a couple of questions uh, during this uh, time for um, cross-examination uh, cross that I think will um, help clarify some of the, uh, the positions that were, were taken. Uh, my first question, uh, Rob, would be, do you agree that sola scriptura, to be true must be taught in the scriptures themselves, or do you uh, make your argument, which it seems is the case uh, tonight, solely on the unique nature of scripture as being the, the written word of God? Uh, well, can you hear me all right? Mike? Yes. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, I would say uh, the truth is my position somewhere between those two extremes. Uh, the, the classic Reformation position uh, regarding doctrine and scripture is articulated in the Westminster Confession of Faith, for example, which is that a, a doctrine to be binding on the church must either be expressly set forth in scripture or must clearly uh, follow from what scripture definitely teaches. Uh, so that uh, the doctrine of sola scriptura does not need to be articulated in so many words or uh, structured in the, the same fashion in the Bible that we would articulate it today, and it could still be 
uh, a, a scriptural doctrine in that it follows from what scripture says. And the analogy here that I would use would be the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, Protestant Christians, Orthodox, evangelical, conservative Protestant Christians accept the doctrine of the Trinity as a biblical doctrine, even though the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity follows necessarily from what Scripture teaches about the unity of the divine being and about the identity and nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So uh, we have no trouble accepting as scriptural or biblical doctrines like that, even if they are not set forth in so many words in Scripture, and that would be the same thing with the doctrine of sola scriptura. It follows from what Scripture claims for itself and for what it, claim, what it teaches about uh, the difference between the Word of God and the words of men that are not the Word of God. And, and that's really, that's, and about the fact that the uh, apostles and prophets are presented in the New Testament as a temporary uh, set of ministries that come to an end uh, with the passing of the apostles at the end of the first century, and that the transition then is to a church that is to be guided by recalling and living by the deposit of faith that they left behind in Scripture. Okay. Now, um, I'm just asking questions for now. I'm not sure if I can uh, do a, a, a minor rebuttal uh, when I do so. But then I would have to say, what verses then, maybe four or five verses, would you point to that articulate this doctrine, since in the case of the Trinity, we could certainly uh, agree on uh, maybe ten verses that settle basically the, uh, the, 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 core, the core concept, which is that of the Trinity. So what scriptures then would you bring forward as being comp compellingly uh, able to teach uh, Sola Scriptura as defined this evening? Well, as I uh, mentioned in the, toward the end of my opening statement, an example of a text that I think uh, is relevant here is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 2, where Peter says that uh, the church is to stand firm against false teachers after the uh, passing of the apostles by holding on to and remembering the words that had been previously spoken uh, by the prophets and Christ through the apostles. That's 2 Peter 3, verse 2. Now, actually, if we were going to do this right, we would go through all of Second Peter and see that this is what Peter is doing throughout the epistle. Uh, from the very beginning of the, uh, of the epistle where he lays out, uh, you know, the fact that we've got everything that we need now for uh, living godly lives, uh, the, the unique character of Scripture that, that we have in the description given at the end of chapter 1, the warning about the false teachers that were like the false prophets of old at the beginning of chapter 2, and then going into chapter 3 and the verse that I quoted, uh, and then concluding with uh, the warning, uh, the exhortation to uh, live by the teachings of the uh, scriptures, including the writings of Paul, uh, and the warning that there are people, of course, that will distort these uh, scriptural teachings. So, actually, I don't really like the idea of being limited to a proof text here or there. If we look through all, all of Second Peter, uh, all of the epistle of Jude, uh, Paul's teaching in Second Timothy, which was his last epistle, we see a consistent pattern here of the apostles laying the, the basis, the, the, the foundation for the transition for the church after the passing of the apostles. And in every case, we find that they are not handing over the keys uh, to an infallible church uh, whose uh, teaching uh, through the bishops are to be regarded as equal in authority to Scripture or equal in authority to the apostles. Uh, they are not uh, designating individuals as the successors to the apostles, but instead they are saying, remember what we said, hold on to what we told you, uh, remember what Christ said through the apostles, remember what the prophet said, the word of God that was given to you, that's the foundation, that's the basis. We see this throughout those final epistles written by Paul, Peter, and Jude in the New Testament. And that's the way that I would develop more thoroughly a biblical basis for sola scriptura. Could you see, though, that in these same uh, letters which you mentioned, and we discussed 2 Thessalonians 2.15, we could discuss also Timothy 
and to Peter that there's also an appeal to what was delivered orally as well as in writing. And do you uh, agree that what was taught uh, in uh, orally uh, was probably, it would make sense, different in scope or in nature than what was taught in writing, as if when someone goes on a trip and says, you know, please follow my instructions that I left you when we spoke and also my notes. Do you see how, in fact, uh, these same uh, epistles could be used to also refer to uh, oral tradition as well to the structure of the church, which is the succession of, of presbyters and, uh, and bishops? Well, this is a hypothetical question. Uh, whether this actually is what's going on in a passage like 2 Thessalonians 2 uh, remains to be seen. I, if you don't mind, uh, I'll, I'll reserve my comment on that verse until we turn the tables here, because I'd like to ask you some questions about that very text. But in general, my answer is, it, it, hypothetically, it could have been that way, but that's not what we see in these epistles. We do not see them referring to uh, oral teachings that are separate from what is being uh, spoken in, or delivered in the writings, that these are in a different category of doctrine or a different category of instruction uh, that supplement uh, or augment what is in uh, the epistles, uh, but rather what we see is uh, they are uh, expecting people to obey them and to, to follow their teaching uh, while they are living, whether it's in writing or not. Okay, so one last question since we have only two minutes. Sure. Um, do you um, agree um, that one could make a very strong case then with specific verses, since you did not mention the classic 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, but that, in fact, sola ecclesia could be uh, uh, a good slogan because the, for the word infallible, the Church is described to be infallibly uh, able to uh, be victorious even over death, and it is described as the pillar and bulwark, or pillar and foundation of the truth in the same epistles which you uh, uh, argue uh, teach uh, Sola Scriptura. Well, let's clear this up right now. Uh, the Church will not fail in its mission to be the people of God, to uh, spread the gospel to all nations, uh, and to uh, you know survive and thrive as the people of God until the second coming of Christ. That, that calling, that mission will not fail. But that's not what we're talking about. I'm not proposing that only Scripture will not fail in, in some vague, undefined sense. I'm saying that Scripture is the only unfailing revelation of doctrinal truth to the Church that we have today that is to be our uh, final court of appeal in matters of controversy among Christians. That's all I'm claiming. Okay, thank you. I think we're done with uh, my session for cross-examination. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. And now, Rob, when you are when you begin, I'll start your 10-minute timer. All right, very good. Uh, Lawrence, let me begin by uh, asking you a question pertaining to your uh, comment, uh, your, your criticism, which you mentioned uh, a couple of times, that you find the slogan sola scriptura misleading, uh, potentially even toxic, would you agree that most slogans, uh, because they tend to be very uh, abbreviated, uh, short, uh, pithy, soundbite expressions, that most uh, slogans are potentially misunderstood if they're not understood in context? I certainly agree, and um, this is such a, a popular and important slogan that admittedly by many uh, uh, reformed Christians or evangelicals, such as uh, I have here on my table a book uh, by Keith uh, Matheson called uh, The Shape of Sola Scriptura, where he admits that basically for most evangelicals, Sola Scriptura is understood and received and lived as Sola Scriptura, the solo, not sola, uh, as in uh, o, uh, o sole mio. So, um, <laughs> yes, there is a real problem uh, in that the slogan which is so... Um, uh, so strong, and this culture is so strong that uh, a pastor and his Bible can kind of reinvent the wheel, that what we see is that this slogan is ultimately dangerous, and uh, and therefore there's this orthodox desire to come out and to refute it, all the while affirming what 
could be said that is true if it was indeed properly explained, which we don't think that it is. Well, let me ask you about a common uh, slogan on the other side, which is the infallibility of the church. Would you agree that the expression, the infallibility of the church, is something that could be easily misused, misunderstood, abused, and even turned into something quite dangerous? I agree that, uh, again, it needs to be uh, uh, explained. Uh, however, you know, I have not seen this um, uh, slogan, uh, destroy the ancient churches. What I see is that for those who have not embraced the slogan, and here I would say uh, uh, Roman Catholics broadly, the Orthodox broadly, including the uh, Oriental Orthodox, what we have seen is, is, is a stable body of doctrine uh, and uh, a stable body of practice. Uh, what we have seen for, for those who have embraced the slogan is disintegration and confusion over all kinds of topics, and especially a loss of awareness that, that the church needs to be identified as it has precise characteristics and that it is uh, what we are called to, to find, to have this infallible assurance that we are joined to Christ. Well, uh, let me move on because I, I have a couple other points I want to address, even though we could spend the entire 10 minutes on this issue. Uh, and let me ask you, uh, as I said I would do, uh, to, uh, to think with me a little bit about Second Thessalonians 2. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you uh, take the position that 2 Thessalonians 2.15 represents a standing order to the church that still applies today, and that it applies in particular to such matters as liturgical practices and not so much to doctrinal matters. Would that be correct? That is correct, yes. I think it's a good summary. If, if you would look at 2 Thessalonians 2, and we don't have the time here, obviously, in, in this brief uh, exchange to do a thorough uh, read-through and exegesis of uh, all of the passage. But if you, if, if you think about what's in 2 Thessalonians 2, in the verses that lead up to, as well as the verses that lead away from, following verse 15, I, I don't see anything in this passage that suggests that holding on to the traditions, whether uh, received by uh, word or you know orally or or uh, a letter um, uh, that this has anything to do with with uh, such matters as liturgical practices making the sign of the cross or facing east when one prays or anything like that but instead it seems to me and I ask your comment on this that it, in the immediate context uh, perhaps epitomized by verses 11 and 12 the issue is whether they are going to believe a falsehood false doctrine or believe the truth that is the basis of the Christian faith. And again, if you look at verses 11 and 12, that seems to be the context. So isn't doctrine, in fact, what Paul is concerned about here in this passage? Well, let me clarify. I, I do think that tradition as a concept uh, certainly embraces liturgical practices, since obviously the scriptures do not have details about it. I also think that Paul uses the language of tradition as in 1 Corinthians 11, to describe specifically the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. Uh, I also agree that uh, tradition embraces what I would say is the proper interpretation of the scriptures. It's, it's something, it's like what the Greek called the skopos. It's, Irenaeus talks about having uh, various uh, uh, stones to form a, a mosaic, and that you can do just about anything with those stones, but if you know what it's supposed to be, in this case, uh, the he talks about a head of a dog or a head of a king. If you know the skopos, which is what tradition has delivered to the churches, then you will not rearrange verses in a way that produces heresy. So agreed, uh, tradition can embrace uh, doctrine, especially the interpretation of doctrine, uh, as well as uh, the, the life of the church. Uh, but my question is, in Second Thessalonians 2.15, in the context, is there any reason to think that uh, holding fast to the traditions there means anything other than holding fast to the true doctrine uh, as opposed to embracing the false lie that Paul warns about in the preceding verses. Well, I would say that the verse is really quite uh, uh, embracing and comprehensive. It comes at the conclusion of the chapter, and I think it's a standing order to these Christians uh, to always maintain what was taught to them uh, through uh, uh, oral teaching or um, in, in the epistles, and uh, I think uh, it, it would be wrong to, to exclude uh, 
liturgical practices from the standing command, which is very broad and, and very all-encompassing. Uh, one more topic I want to explore with you very briefly in the time remaining, and that has to do with infant baptism. And this also uh, f focusing here on your uh, distinction between uh, doctrine, which you say you agree must be uh, demonstrable from Scripture, and practices such as uh, the sacraments and liturgical practices and so forth, which you say do not need to be demonstrated from Scripture, but can be uh, known uh, exclusively, if that is the case, uh, from this oral tradition. Uh, and in that context, you cited the example of infant baptism. But my question is, is it really possible to separate the practice of infant baptism from the theology that undergirds it. In other words, infant baptism presupposes in any communion that practices it some theological rationale for the practice that involves uh, understandings of such issues as when a person is regenerate and what causes or precipitates or precedes that regeneration, uh, how the Holy Spirit works in connection with faith, if a conscious uh, faith is necessary for a person to be regenerated, uh, what, it, what is involved and what is required to be incorporated into the church uh, as a practicing member of the, communi of the communion of faith and so forth. So isn't it true that you can't really separate a theology uh, or a doctrine uh, from the liturgical or sacramental practice? It is quite true. In fact, uh, St. Irenaeus says that our theology agrees with the Eucharist and the Eucharist agrees with our theology, the uh, the. Uh, the, the theology of the church is fully expressed in the liturgical life. But I would say that as an example in view of the debate uh, among, you know, pedo-baptists and, and Baptists on this issue, people that only rely on scripture, and you can see that the deadlock between people of uh, trying to bring sincere arguments, I would say that this is a case where we can learn about what the apostles taught not only as you suggested by reading their letters, but also by reading the letters of those who were immediately followers or those who were aware of what was going on in the churches at large. Origen, for example, uh, was close enough. He, make a he makes a, a, a distinction between his own speculations and what is well established, just traveled extensively. So when he says that the apostles delivered this practice, I think it is an important uh, illustration of this principle that uh, uh, tradition and the churches are needed to properly interpret and use the scriptures infallibly. Well, Lawrence, thanks for letting me ask you these uh, questions and appreciate your responses. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> Lawrence, are you ready to give your closing or do you need a, a moment? It's fine. I'm ready to go. Okay. Well, as soon as you begin, I'll go ahead and start your five-minute timer. Okay, again, I want to uh, say thank you to, uh, uh, to Chris and Rob for uh, making this uh, discussion, this debate uh, possible. I'd like to share some reflections then on what is at stake ultimately. For instance, I think that Christians should be concerned not only to read the scriptures as the word of God, uh, but also to identify what and where is the church? The same scriptures which uh, we embrace as having this unique authority points us to the church as a pillar and foundation of truth. It tells us to be obedient to, to the presbyters or elders, as in uh, uh, Hebrews uh, 13. And so I think that the danger, again, with Sola Scriptura is that it distracts people from the primordial quest, so to speak, which is to find where is the Eucharist and where is the Church. Infallible to me, this term which we used, and admittedly, uh, Rob said that, well, it's kind of an idealistic thing, it's, it's kind of a theory. In practice, we have limited knowledge, we have degrees of certainty. Indeed, um, when you read, for example, the letter of um, St. Um, Ignatius of Antioch, he stresses that we should only consider it assured, Greek bebeia, that Eucharist, which has certain characteristics. And 
I believe that the scriptures need to function in harmony with the Eucharist, which is the church, which in harmony with the bishops in succession historically, and indeed in uh, our case being orthodox in geographical succession since the very same churches that are in the scriptures, uh, Corinth and Thessaloniki, uh, still exist to this very day. Even Jerusalem, people can go and see how things are done. I would be concerned uh, uh, not to pay close attention to these practices, which St. Basil could write were accepted universally, such as the way uh, a baptism takes place, such as the way the Eucharist is administered, uh, such as particular um, particular uh, ways that the Church lives and the way the Church joins people to Christ for their salvation. And so this is a concern that uh, I want to address, is to redirect people uh, through their uh, sense of scripture to finding both church and tradition. The, the, the problem with Sola Scriptura is that it misleads people often into believing that all they need is the scriptures apart from this pre-existing divinely ordained structure. If the scriptures are indeed divinely inspired that the Spirit was at work, we must also realize that the Church is also a, a divine uh, spiritual organism likewise. If we look at a text such as 2 Timothy 3.16, we see that it is for the man of God, Timothy, who was in fact ordained in the Church, it's for him to be fully equipped. It does not exist just for anyone who would pick up the book apart from the pre-existing uh, Eucharist of the Church that pre-exists anyone. Moreover, many of the uh, definitions of Sola Scriptura uh, are in fact misleading in that in order to exist, the Scriptures did need the existence and the testimony of the churches and the bishops historically to come into existence. And the question that needs to be brought forward is, if we trust these people that preserved and discerned the scriptures, a process that uh, uh, was concluded around the year 367, should we not also trust the same teachers for these other things, such as baptism, the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the way things are done, and seek the Church where Christ established it. And that concludes my statement. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. And now, Rob, when you begin, I'll start your five-minute timer. All right, thank you very much. Well, as uh, I believe it was Ronald Reagan uh, that said many years ago, uh, in a very different context than the one that we're dealing with here, uh, trust but verify. Uh we should uh, learn from, uh, embrace, uh, and accept all the truth that we can possibly uh, glean and learn from uh, Christians who've gone before us, uh, from the early church fathers, uh, from all Christians throughout uh, church history, and uh, from Christians of uh, communions, of denominations and traditions that differ from ours. Uh, I think that it would be a shame for evangelical Protestants not to learn from Eastern Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters, and uh, vice versa. I think it would be a shame for us uh, both not to learn from our Roman Catholic brethren and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, uh, n none of these uh, communions uh, have an exclusive monopoly on the truth of Jesus Christ. Uh, none of them can claim that it and it alone, exclusively and comprehensively, is the Church. Uh, Lawrence is correct in saying that uh, a big question here is what is the church? And, uh, you know, when you talk about a passage like Matthew 16, uh, 18, where Christ promises that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the church, uh, this cannot be uh, restated to mean uh, that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the Orthodox Church with a capital O, uh, as distinguished from, say, the Roman Catholic Church or Protestantism. Uh, it is not referring to a specific segment of the church, and I would insist that, uh, and I know that Father Lawrence would disagree with me, that the Orthodox Church is not 
uh, the sum and total of the church, but it is part of the church. We are all part of the body of Christ if we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and if we are baptized into the body of believers, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. Uh, really, and it's very difficult to separate in a discussion like this the doctrine of Scripture uh, or bibliology, to use the 50-cent word, uh, from the doctrine of the church or ecclesiology, because our ecclesiology and our bibliology are obviously going to be related. The fact of the matter is that uh, uh, Christians who, do, who reject sola scriptura do not all agree on the identity, boundaries, uh, nature, authority, structure, etc. of the church. Uh, of obviously, uh, the elephant in the room here is the Roman Catholic Church and the differences between Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians as to what exactly is the church and who's in charge, uh, where this infallibility of the church resides and how it is expressed. There is severe disagreement. Uh, even among Christians in these different communions, there is disagreement about a lot of things uh, that, that gets uh, brushed over. Uh, in these kinds of discussions. Uh, Protestantism uh, has the obvious flaw that it has many divisions. And many people blame this on sola scriptura. I would propose that that is not a fair uh, judgment. Sola scriptura is not the problem. The problem is human beings are fallible. Human beings are sinful. Human beings are by nature stubborn. Uh, pig-headed, divisive, uh, as well as ignorant and limited in their perspectives. Uh, Protestantism perhaps brings that out in a very obvious way in terms of the number of denominations and the number of specific organizational units that it comprises. But there is division, confusion, uh, misunderstandings, disagreements, etc. in every part of Christianity and not just in Protestantism. The problem isn't scripture. The problem isn't sola scriptura. The problem is those who are knowing scripture and learning from it are quite flawed, fallible, immature, and we have a lot of room to grow. Uh, we invite all Christians to participate in the hard work of reading scripture and understanding it correctly and abiding by it. And that is a process that will go forward in every part of the church can contribute to it, but the standard will always be Scripture. Scripture alone is the infallible revelation from God available to the church today by which we can adjudicate the doctrinal controversies that persist in Christianity. God bless you all, and thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Rob. All right, so now we'll move into the question and answer period, and I only received one question for each of you from listeners, so I've come up with a few others myself, and we'll see how uh, unbiased and objective I was able to be. Um, but let's let's start with Rob. Let, let's let's pose the first question to you, and this question comes from a, a friend of a friend of mine. His name is Florin, and he's a Eastern Orthodox, and here's what he says. There are many texts in the Bible whose meaning is unclear and individual readers, however sincere, are in danger of error if they trust their own personal interpretation. The Ethiopian eunuch rhetorically asked how he could understand the prophet Isaiah without a guide. The Orthodox Church recognizes one source of authority, that of the apostolic tradition, of which the Holy Scriptures are only one very important part. Doesn't the myriad of conflicting Protestant denominations and interpretations of the same texts prove that the Scriptures are not enough to guide a soul to the right understanding? And you have two and a half minutes to respond. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I guess I need to elaborate on that, do, uh, do, don't I? Uh, sola Scriptura does not mean uh, the Scripture is, is all so plain there's never going to be any doctrinal disagreement. That, that, if it predicted that or expected that, that would be a legitimate criticism. Uh, misunderstandings of Scripture would abound whether we had Protestantism or not. But at least with Protestantism, you have an open acknowledgement that there are things in Scripture that people don't fully understand or on which people are not fully agreed. Uh, so that's really the problem. The problem isn't the doctrine of Scripture that Protestants hold. It's simply bringing out into the open the fact that there's a lot that we have to learn about Scripture and that not everybody views it in the same way. Uh, there were theological disagreements among Christians and exegetical differences of opinion among exegetes long before the Protestants came along. Uh, now, of course, there was agreement on the essentials. There was agreement on the 
uh, regular fide, the rule of faith. There still is uh, Protestants, Protestants who accept the classic Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura, still accept the same rule of faith expressed in the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and so forth. We hold to the same basic doctrinal system. We hold to the same basic view of God. None of those things uh, are are lost if you accept the Protestant view of sola scriptura. Now, if you accept restorationism, you might lose those things. And I've talked about that. And in fact, I talked about it in my opening statement. But you don't lose those things uh, by holding to sola scriptura. What sola scriptura does is allow us to break open uh, the word of God, to, to get into it with an honest acknowledgement that we're not all going to agree on the exegesis of specific texts. And this is fundamental, that the meaning of scripture is to be found from scripture not imposed from the outside by a church dictating how it is to be read. Okay, thank you, Rob. <clears throat> Lawrence, your uh, one-minute response. It is uh, a good question in the sense that, uh, indeed, in the context of uh, the book of Acts, the Ethiopian is asking for guidance. Uh, by the way, uh, baptism is involved in this moment, and uh, when uh, St. Peter discusses the, uh, the danger, so to speak, uh, with the misuse of uh, St. Paul's letters, he talks about the, the untaught. And so the question is, someone has to teach. There are, in fact, teachers in the church. And the question becomes, again, where are the teachers? Because we today, when we inherit uh, as a gift sometimes uh, uh, a Bible, we have before us all of these teachers, and in orthodoxy we especially emphasize the pre-Nicene and post-Nicene fathers, and all of them together give give us that teaching which we need to understand what is meant, for example, uh, uh, in particular uh, uh, doctrinal controversies, uh, uh, what is the, how should we uh, in- interpret, for example, uh, John okay. chapter 6, and so forth. Okay, thanks, Lawrence. Uh, now, my next question is for you, Lawrence. This comes from a listener of mine named Tyler, and, and I'm not quite sure what his uh, what tradition he comes from. But he asks, how do you, Lawrence, understand the eschatological maturation or, or maturing of the church into full unity, as mentioned in passages like Ephesians 4.13? And you've got two and a half minutes. Okay, I'm not sure the question has anything to do with uh, Sola Scriptura. Um, uh, except if uh, it is to imply that somehow the, the the church and Christians will grow into some kind of a new knowledge and and so forth, and that of course would be a problem because we would say that the faith was delivered once for all to the saints, Jude verse three, and that we are under the standing command to not alter the apostolic uh, command that we are to to receive the things that that have been deposited to us and to change nothing. If the question has to do with ecclesiology, then I would say that uh, there is a uh, dimension of the church, which is, uh, you could say, super temporal, uh, which you could compare to the uh, Holy of Holies, and it is made manifest in space and time, in particular locations, in the Eucharist, and that is the structure of the church, as long as the, the bishops and presbyters and deacons and people are there and that they are in succession and communion with all the churches of the past and, and through space and time. So the question is very odd to me as far as being uh, related to Sola Scriptura, but maybe Rob has an insight that he wants to share. Rob? Uh, well, actually, I think it's a very interesting and, and appropriate question because in, in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 13, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, speaks of the ministries of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers as contributing to the building up of the body of Christ, and then verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. Now, this statement clearly implies that unity of the faith was not a given at the beginning of church history. It is a goal toward which church history moves. And so why is that if the church has had a monolithic, uh, unified structure, uh, system of command and regulation 
an administration that guarantees the unity of the faith as long as everybody uh, submits to the ecclesiastical authorities. That doesn't make <laughs> sense in the context of what Paul says there in Ephesians 4. Okay. All right, now, for the rest of these questions, the, the remaining three for each of you, I've, I've come up with these on my own, and, and many of them I've come up with uh, during the course of the debate, so hopefully they're, they're relevant. Uh, and this one I'm, I'm returning back to you, Rob. Uh, Lawrence pointed out that the New Testament doesn't give us a whole lot of detail about church practices, um, and, and there's some people who would argue that in certain places, instructions which are given aren't followed by Protestants today. Now, you said that practices have to be consistent with Scripture, but that anything not prohibited by Scripture is allowed, uh, if I might paraphrase what you said. But what about places like 1 Corinthians 7.17 where Paul says he directs all the churches to do certain things. Doesn't scripture seem to indicate that the churches should be consistent with one another in church practice? And if that's the case, given the lack of detail in scripture when it comes to practice, how can it be the sole infallible rule? Well, where uh, the apostles, uh, as we see in the New Testament, provide instructions that are to apply to all the churches as Paul's instruction did in that context there in 1 Corinthians 7, then, of course, all the churches were supposed to follow that practice. But Paul also points out that there are matters of practice on which Christians will have disagreement and different points of view, and he actually says that uh, in such matters, everybody should simply make up their own mind and uh, act in accordance with their conscience and with respect and consideration for the conscience of others. For example, we see this in Romans 14. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that some practical matters are expected to be uh, uniform throughout the church, and other practical matters are left undefined, are left open to interpretation or variant practices in various contexts, and where Scripture uh, provides uh, no such uh, direction that all Christians must follow, uh, then there is no one practice that all Christians must follow. Now, the, you know, if we look at something like the issue of infant baptism, the claim uh, that the church has always done it the same way simply doesn't hold up historically. Uh, the evidence, as best I can tell, shows that infant baptism was a controversial question in the third century, not a settled matter that the Christian church had always done in one way and in one way only. Uh, there wouldn't have been a controversy over it if it had been always done in the same way. So sometimes the argument for an apostolic tradition outside of what we find in the New Testament ends up having a certain historical naivete that doesn't hold up under close examination. Okay, Lawrence your, Lawrence, your one-minute response. Well, it is certainly uh, interesting to see that uh, we just discussed the, the matter of growing into unity and uh, manifesting in every place uh, because the church is always a reality in a particular place. Uh, it's, it's critical to see that church is always church in Rome, church in Corinth, church in a given city, and then you have churches. And it was important uh, that the churches had a uniform practice also for the sake of unity, for the sake of having a common experience. St. Basil, writing in the 300s, talks about this, this, this uniformity of traditions that was at least in the, in the entire Christian East uh, to be found. There were some, some minor variations perhaps in the West, but it is certain that because the scriptures do not give us Due to the very nature of the epistles and due to the, the nature of the, the sacraments, they are, uh, quote, mystery, they are pearls. Therefore, we need to look at the apostolic uh, traditions from the early churches, and we need to do our best to continue them. Uh, I personally think that um, uh, the, the case of peace, for example, uh, which was uh, lost to an extent in the Orthodox churches, should be restored in some form because it is an apostolic tradition and we are bound by these traditions. Okay. Uh, my next question for you, Lawrence, is this. The New Testament contains several texts which seem to indicate that we are to test that what we are taught 
is true, condemning those who teach another gospel and another Jesus, if scripture is not the sole infallible rule, by what mechanism, by what means can we test those who claim to also have some sort of infallible rule, such as the Eastern Orthodox tradition? Well, as we've discussed in this debate, uh, it is uh, uh, an agreed uh, fact, it seems to me, that during a time of inscripturation, the the Christians, the people of God, do not operate under sola scriptura, because there is a an oral proclamation of the word of God being delivered uh, either by the Lord himself, he's the incarnate word of God, or the apostles. So, the the verses that appeal to testing cannot possibly, except if they refer to some time in the future, teach sola scriptura. The testing has to be done, uh, at least at the time of the scriptures being written, uh, by comparing what, what the apostles taught. And again, we see to Peter and Jude pointing back to what was taught to these people by the authorities that will be uh, the apostles and those appointed by them. And for us, certainly, everything has to conform to scripture. The dogmas have to be rooted in scriptures and they have to be uh, there in some material form. However, we can resort to uh, to, an, to the entire structure given by God, which is the church and tradition through the centuries and through the spaces, so to speak, to make sure that our interpretation of a text is in harmony with what has been taught everywhere at all times and by all, to cite here uh, St. Vincent of Lerain in his uh, famous principle of universality. Rob, your one-minute response? Yes, two passages that I think are quite fascinating and irrelevant to this uh, relevant to this question. The first is in Acts 17, verse 11. Uh, when Paul and Silas went to Berea and uh, preached to the Jews in the synagogue there, Luke tells us that the Berean Jews welcomed the message with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Even the teaching of the apostles uh, which was not yet inscripturated, was tested by that which was already uh, uh, deposited permanently for the people of God in Scripture, and that's what these Thessalonians did. The other passage I want to uh, cite here is Galatians chapter 1 and 2. And I, would, I don't have time to go through the whole passage, but if you read through, what you find is that Paul does not appeal to the infallible church or to the church bishop structure or even the other College of Apostles as giving him authority as the apostle that he was, but rather he derives his authority directly from Jesus Christ and appeals to his, list, his readers to base their understanding of the gospel on the revelation, not on an infallible church. Okay, Rob, my next question for you. Uh, you responded to Lawrence's argument from the New Testament Church, uh, or, or that the New Testament Church could not operate by sola scriptura, by saying that they had living apostles uh, delivering the infallible word of God. What, what indication is there in scripture, if any, that there would be this sort of transition from a period of infallible ap- apostolic authority to deliver the word of God to another period of time in which we're in now, uh, in which we should operate by sola scriptura? Yes, well, again, uh, I the, the epistles that I cited that I think are particularly relevant here are Second Timothy, Second Peter, and the Epistle of Jude. In these epistles, each of these three apostles, uh, and implicitly, and actually with Paul and Peter, it's explicitly uh, acknowledge that they're about to pass from the scene. Uh, the apostles are, as a group, passing from the scene. This is in the mid to late 60s, apparently. And uh, they are making provision for the church uh, to remain faithful to the gospel after the apostles pass. They do not say, listen to the successors to the apostles. Instead, they say, remember what your apostles and prophets told you in the past. This is what we find in Scripture. If we want to know what the apostles said, if we want to know what the prophets said, we look to Scripture, that's where we find their words. We see Peter saying this in Second Peter 2 and 3. We see Jude saying this in Jude verse 17. Uh, we see that Paul in Second Timothy 3 and 4, uh, again, uh, one goes through the whole passage there and not just picks out a verse out of context, 
Paul is making provision uh, through Timothy uh, for the transition to a church that does not have apostles. Uh, this is going to be a church in which faithful people, not infallible people, but faithful people, faithfully pass on the teaching that they got, and they do so by remembering and being faithful to the words of Scripture, which are able to make them adequate for the work that God calls them to, as Peter, as Paul puts it in 2 Timothy 3.17. So those are the uh, places where I would especially point to as evidence that the apostles themselves were laying the groundwork for that transition. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lawrence, your one-minute response? I would certainly want to balance again that approach because certainly uh, the apostles were aware that uh, their writings would uh, be used as scripture and would uh, become the touchstone of apostolic uh, teaching because they would be certified, so to speak, and in written form. But it's also very clear in the epistles which we discussed, one, that there is reference to the personal spoken word uh, both in uh, to Peter as well as in the epistle of uh, uh, St. Paul to Timothy to remember where it came from. There's a, this real personal approach to what was taught. This would be the point of reference. Remember who taught it, who it was. And then there's this charge to, uh, to create a structure to appoint men who would then be able to faithfully pass it on and to discharge the office in the church. So again, what we see is that there is tradition which is passing on, passing on both the oral teachings and also passing on a structure. And there is also uh, the church, which is highlighted, again, in 1 Timothy 3.15. And there is the scriptures. All of three are inseparable. And I think it would be an error, again, to isolate to isolate uh, with a sola scriptura and to miss uh, the other aspects, which are fundamental to uh, God's uh, and Christ's mind for his people. Okay. Uh, Lawrence, my next question for you is, uh, if I remember correctly, you quoted Origen as support for infant baptism and for evidence that apostolic tradition is necessary for church practice. Uh, but from what I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Origen taught things like universalism, he taught the eternal pre-existence of the soul, he denied the historicity of certain portions of scripture, and he denied that Jesus rose physically from the grave. Irenaeus taught that Jesus' ministry lasted over ten years and that he died at fifty or older. So, uh, if you can cite Origen and Irenaeus as evidence that apostolic tradition is the infallible rule of doctrine and practice, shouldn't all three of us and those listening also be universalists, believe that the soul pre-exists forever and that Jesus rose only spiritually from the dead at the age of 50 after some 10 or more years of ministry? Well, it's a good question, uh, and I would not use uh, the term infallible in, in that way, in an intellectual sense. Uh, I would say that infallibility ultimately is in terms of soteriology, is is us being saved by being joined to Christ, and that is done uh, especially in the church, which is the body of Christ, and in the mysteries, especially the Eucharist and uh, uh, baptism, but also the other sacraments. Now, uh, it's very interesting that Origen is very careful in his writings to distinguish between his own speculations, for example, in his famous book, The Principis, where he does... Uh, speculate on all kinds of things from what is indeed the practice of the churches and what is from the apostles and it is in fact because Origen is so specific in, in making that difference that we can isolate what is traditional what is apostolic what is what is claimed to, by the bishops what is done by the churches uh, and what would be speculations another example would be for example that Origen says that all the churches of Christ use the longer canon, the so-called Septuagint, that all Christians uh, under heaven, he says, have received from providence th these extra books. So whether we like that or not, he he's able to give us factual information about what has been received, and we can distinguish that from uh, speculations. And I won't comment so much on Irenaeus, because I think there's some complexities with the text. It comes from the Latin tra translation of the Greek. It's not always clear what he means. And I don't think that we can really uh, criticize tradition based on that particular instance in Irenaeus. Okay, hey, Rob, your one-minute response? Yeah, well, it's a good thing I had my uh, microphone on m mute when you asked your question because I burst out laughing. <laughs> uh, look, uh, Lawrence has really uh, 
backed away from affirming the infallibility of the church, except in what he calls a soteriological sense. But that's not in dispute here. And the, the real issue is the infallibility of doctrinal statements, uh, truth claims made outside of Scripture. The Protestant position is no doctrinal or truth claims made outside of Scripture carry the character of authority known as infallibility. Only that which is found in Scripture that we have today uh, has that authority. And so that's really the issue here. Okay, uh, Rob, my final question for you. Uh, as Lawrence pointed out, and I, and I don't think that I heard you respond to this, Paul said to Timothy that the church, the household of God, is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Doesn't this indicate that it is the church and its tradition and not solely scripture, which is this infallible rule of faith and practice for Christians today? Well, uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 is is uh, if taken as a disproof of sola scriptura would really end up subordinating scripture to the church. In other words, if we understand 1 Timothy 3.15 to say that the church is the uh, final court of appeal and the final authority uh, uh, for uh, doctrinal issues or for you know whatever of that nature, uh, then it ends up subordinating Scripture to the church. So the argument really proves too much. I think that in context, what Paul is saying is this is what the church is supposed to be, not what it infallibly always is. That is, the church is the community of God, uh, the followers of Jesus Christ, whose charge and responsibility is to support the truth, is to stand up for the truth, uh, to uphold it, etc. We can use all the same kinds of imagery that Paul uses uh, and put it in modern terminology. That's what the church is supposed to do. That's what the church generally does, uh, but fallibly, not infallibly. Uh, the church does not infallibly exercise this responsibility. Uh, and because of that, we need to be careful about assuming that whatever we hear from the church uh, must be true and cannot be challenged. Uh, at various points in history, at key points in history, there's been a very significant need for the few to stand up to the many. It happened in the fourth century with Athanasius. It happened about a thousand years later with Wycliffe. Uh, there are times when Christians of good conscience must stand against the machine, must stand against the church as an establishment, as an institution, at status quo, uh, must challenge the conventional wisdom. That's what Athanasius did. It's what Wycliffe did. It's what various Christians have had to do at various times. The doctrine of an infallible church, which actually Lawrence has kind of backed away from, uh, would, would take that away. Sola Scriptura maintains the basis for that. It says here is the standard by which we can always do a, a, a reality check as to whether what the church is teaching is in, in fact faithful to the gospel. Lawrence, your one minute response? We can see the risk again in divorcing the scriptures from the church. We don't want to subordinate, uh, the scriptures to the church. In fact, the great uh, Bishop of uh, Jerusalem in the, in the 300s, uh, Cyril, when he teaches the catechumens, he says, on the one hand, don't accept anything from me except if I can show it to you from the scriptures. But then he says also, learn from the church what the scriptures contain. And we see that there's a mutual uh, indwelling, a, a perichoresis, so to speak, almost kind of like in the Trinity between church, scripture, and tradition. <coughs> and that we need these three pillars to have sound doctrine. Okay, uh, final question for the evening, uh, and this is back to you, Lawrence. Many organizations s claim to have some sort of infallible authority that, that we as Christians ought to submit. Uh, why is it that we should assume that the Eastern Orthodox tradition is this authority rather than, say, the Roman Catholic Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Watchtower and the Jehovah's Witnesses and so on and so forth? Why Eastern Orthodoxy? Okay, the, the point that I think we tried to make this evening is that uh, Christ has uh, established his church, uh, and that for us to be delivered from the gates of death, so to speak, and from the final perdition, we have to be joined to this church. Now, the church, again, is 
to be uh, defined as the manifestation of God's of, of Christ's body in a particular place, and that requires particular attributes according to the mind of Christ, to use Ignatius's of Antioch's uh, expression. And in the in the Orthodox Church, what you have is you have the tradition, the body that historically you could say literally preserved, discerned the scriptures, received the traditions about the way things are to be done. We still practice them to this very day. You can read Cyril of Jerusalem in the 300s. You can read Basil and you say, wow, it's the same practices, it's the same faith, it's the same liturgy. And therefore we say that for those who seek the church, who seek certainty that they are uh, in obedience to Christ's mind, to Christ's divinely appointed structure, to have that assurance that is to be found in the Orthodox faith and what we call the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Bob? Yeah, well, uh, the idea of going back uh, to find out what the Church is really all about is a good idea, but uh, we need to go back a little bit further than Irenaeus and Basil. We need to go back to Peter and Paul, James and John, and what we find is that Though the, the basic uh, theological uh, commitments of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, etc., are, are in place in the Orthodox Church that we find in the New Testament, we also find a lot of things in Orthodoxy that are not in the New Testament, that I would argue are not even faithful to the spirit of the New Testament. The New Testament does not have the kind of ecclesiastical, monolithic structure that either the Roman Catholic or the Eastern Orthodox traditions maintain is essential to the operation of the Christian Church. And so that's the disconnect that Sola Scriptura forces us to take account of. Okay, well, with that, I just want to thank you both so much. I, I really enjoyed the debate. I think that it was handled in a very irenic, amicable manner. So, so thank you both so much for, for joining me tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rob. I think it was a good debate. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it very much, both of you. Thank you. All right, well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I hope that you'll join me for the next episode of the The Apologetics Podcast when Lawrence returns to debate infant baptism with Reformed Baptist Jamin Hubner. Until then, 